The opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and guest and are not necessarily those of WPSL or WSTU. This station does not endorse products that may be mentioned. Any reproduction or retransmission of this broadcast is strictly prohibited without the express permission and written consent of this station. Phone lines are open for your questions and comments. Call 220-9788 or 340-1590. And now, here's your host. And you're in the studio with the Treasure Coast Car Guys, your host, Steve Friend. Welcome back. Good morning, Veronica. How are you today? I'm well, and you? Great. Super. And welcome, Gary. Welcome back. Yep, I'm here. Gary. Always good to see you. I'm always good to be seen. How's the shoulder? It's getting better. I'm losing some weight back in the gym. Physical therapy. Um, it's, it's coming along. It's coming good. along. Good. If I could put a shirt on, it'd be great. <laughs> well, that's next step. I next guess step. That's, uh, they got to teach you that physical therapy. Yeah. So last week, just like to recap a couple things about uh, some of the conversation, we dedicated a lot of the show to uh, tires, about uh, the different types of tires, the ease of uh, purchasing tires online, but of course the issues that come with buying tires online with the uh, shipping costs and then finding a place to install them and what have you. So we just wanted to uh, reconfirm uh, a couple things for everybody uh, as far as tire sales. And when you go to our websites, which for the Lexus store would be www.treasurecoastlexus.com or Treasure Coast. Uh, www.treasurecoasttoyotaofstuart.com. We have tire analyzers that allows you to pick uh, tires that are the original <coughs> equipment tires or tires that are specifically recommended for that particular model and year. New shoes for your car. Exactly. <laughs> That's what it feels like. And yeah. it's, the, it's so easy to do, yeah. and they're all competitively priced. And you get prices there as well? Exactly. Super. You can get the pricing, mm-hmm. and they also have a good, better, best model. And the purpose of that is if you just have a short time left on the lease or uh, it's just uh, to fill a gap period of time or something, mm-hmm. and you don't want to go for the more expensive tires because you're going to have the car just for a shorter period of time. So it gives a lot of versatility. Uh, it answers basically all the questions. And uh, just wanted to reiterate and just make sure that everybody uh, – Everybody was listening to that because uh, we got a tremendous response at the dealership about the tires and the Great. discussion. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and now is a good time for new tires? I mean, now is it's an it awesome like, time. Okay. Tires are always on special at our store. Okay. Always on special. Yeah. And uh, different times of the year, of course, some of the manufacturers do uh, rebate back. And when that occurs, we usually send our entire database uh, out emails to notify people. So if they are in the market or they're thinking or the last service, it indicates that they might need tires down the road. Uh, we want them to be able to take full advantage of all pricing. It sends uh, money back from the discounts. manufacturer. Correct. Super. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It comes in the form of a gift card. It's a mail-in rebate. Okay. Right. So, and some of the manufacturers do that, some don't. But regardless, our pricing is going to be the most competitive anywhere. And uh, one of the things that uh, Gary and I were discussing briefly this morning, uh, we said last week that when we uh, take in our new cars from the manufacturer and they're delivered, uh, part of the pre-delivery inspection, for short we call that PDI, but the pre-delivery inspection, besides checking the air uh, temperatures in all the, uh, all the tires, we take the regular air out of the tires and we add the nitro- nitrogen. Mm-hmm. And we do that for several reasons. Uh, better gas mileage, the cars run cooler, uh, retains the nitrogen better than plain air. But what Gary was telling me is that the tires do get registered and uh, that will give an additional roadside uh, uh, guarantee on the car. So, for yeah. example, you come in and you buy a Lexus from us. Uh, let's say three or four hundred miles later you're driving and God forbid you hit something in the road or whatever and a tire is damaged, uh, we'll be able to replace that tire for free. Yes, we will. That's part of the uh, nitro fill program that we offer our clients. And when you purchase a car brand new, that is free. That's free. Um, after the first year, you can come in and um, we can you know, load you back up again. So just wanted to make sure that everybody is on board uh, with our websites. And should you not, should you have an issue or it's uh, maybe a little bit too complicated or you're not that computer savvy, please feel free to call Gary at our dealership. Call myself, Steve Friend, uh, at uh, 460-0000. Uh, we're happy to speak to you or put you in the right, put in touch with the right person who knows tires. And uh, we can set an appointment and we can have you in and out one, two, three. So. With that said, I just wanted to uh, share a couple of interesting stories that happened this weekend. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I traveled up to New York uh, for a uh, family occasion in the middle of all the craziness. Yeah, so you were in the Big Apple during... It was uh, kind of crazy. Well, actually, I wasn't really uh, right in the city. I was okay. out in Long Island, yep. in Lawrence to be exact. And uh, we were uh, put up in neighbors' homes next to my, uh, my daughter's house. And we had a uh, whole family fly in from all over the country and some in uh, Canada as well that came in for a big party for the weekend. So we probably had about 60 people there just from our family. But uh, we stayed in one of the neighbor's homes. And as uh, my wife and I were entering the door, uh, the, the owner of the home greets us. And he says, well, I understand you're the Lexus guy. And before we go any further, before we even show you to your room, <laughs> you need to sit down. And I need to discuss the differences between the RX and the NX. I didn't even get two words in. <laughs> so <laughs> word travel working. fast. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're always working in the car business. You're always on call. Sure. But uh, it was very interesting. Is he going to come down and pick one out? Well, that would be my <laughs> hope. But I did give uh, some information. And it's really funny because people a lot of times will always ask, well, what do you think about this model mm -hmm. versus the other model? And it's really not so much what I think. Because I'm not going to be the one driving it, number one. Mm -hmm. And uh, my. And isn't that kind of hard? Isn't it like saying which one of your kids is your favorite? Uh, yeah, that, that's pretty <laughs> tough, okay? Because all the Lexus cars right. and sport utilities are my favorites. <laughs> but it was a really interesting conversation. And I just, you know, I, I thought about it all the way home on the plane. I, it was just, I was smiling that mm -hmm. that was the first thing that he thought about. But it was an interesting conversation because the new NX. Uh, is really a tremendous seller. This car came out in 2015, and it's setting incredible records, although the RX is still the best-selling sport utility, not only for Lexus, but 27% 27 nationally of mm -hmm. all sport utilities, luxury sport utilities sold in the United States are RXs. So we've kind of cornered the market and owned the market on that, and with the addition of the NX, we're really building up uh, a tremendous amount of cars on the road. Well, those crossover but SUVs are really, really hot right now. So Very, very yeah. hot. Okay. I just bought one. Yes, he did. Uh, two months ago, uh, Gary came in getting ready to say goodnight, and I said, you know, Gary, we're one car short of our objective. He says, well, I was thinking about well, getting rid of that. my GS. And, <laughs> yeah. and less than an hour later, he was driving down the road in his new RX. But the point being is that uh, you couldn't really make uh, an argument one way or another for the NX versus the RX. Because what we're finding is that people who've owned the RXs before are more inclined to go to the RX because it is a little bigger. Although families would maybe one child, or if they plan maybe two child, two children maximum, mm -hmm. they seem to be gravitating a little bit towards the new NX. So either way, we're just so blessed to have both those models in our lineup. But I just found it very, very interesting about how the first thing, not even hello, how you doing, let me show you yeah. to your room. First <laughs> let's thing, talk please, cars. Let's talk cars. Let's talk <laughs> NX versus RX. So uh, he's probably going to go with the RX because that's what he had before. Mm-hmm. But the other thing was very interesting that I would just like to talk about for a couple of minutes. And I met a, uh, an automotive broker up in New York. Now, for those of the listeners who don't know what an automotive broker is, that's somebody who tries to fa facilitate a sale where a client doesn't want to go to the dealership. Okay. And it's really interesting because uh, as I was talking with him, I said, well, what do you think fuels your, your business? And he says, well, it's very simple. In New York, people don't like to go to the car dealership. And I said, well, why? He said, because they don't like the experience. Yeah, we talked about that now, last week. Mm -hmm. If you remember, last week I made a statement, which is in writing, 97% of all automotive uh, people who buy cars from the dealership are dissatisfied for one reason or another, and only 3% of the buyers are extremely and 100% satisfied. So, now we know that that statistic has been around for many, many, many years. The old saying, I'd rather go to the dentist and get my mm -hmm. teeth pulled than go buy a mm -hmm. car. <laughs> and coming up to the Treasure Coast, number one, because of the uniqueness of the uh, geographic area and because of the demographics, the people that it's made up of, allowed us for our two dealerships to change the way that we do business 
and to eradicate a bad reputation and make it a good reputation, but not just a good reputation, making it an experience that not only will people love coming to the dealership, but will want to keep coming back, whether it be for service, whether it's just for a car wash, whether it's just to come by and say hi. And in the four and a half years that I've been there, and now Gary is just about four years, we've seen a family of clientele grow in both of our dealerships that really is second to none on the Treasure Coast. And we firmly believe that it is based strictly on the experience, the level of attention, and the way people are treated from the moment they walk into the dealership. We don't have people waiting outside to attack. Mm -hmm. uh, we <laughs> wait, obviously, until people come into the dealership. We direct them. We get them something cold to drink. And the whole theory why we believe that our experience is different is because we treat people as if they are a guest in our own home. Now, you know that when you invite people over to your home, mm -hmm. you want them to be uh, as comfortable. You want to be as hospitable as possible. Right. You want to offer them something to eat. You want to have the everything perfect, the bathroom spotless. You just want them to make them feel as if it's they're ready to move in. And that is the credo for both of our dealerships. And we have seen such an amazing <coughs> attrition of clients because of that. So for the gentleman that I met in New York, I can honestly say that we don't have a need for that on the Treasure Coast and for most of the Florida market because a lot of dealerships, a lot, okay, have finally learned that it is all about the treatment. And when someone walks into your dealership and you shake hands and you meet them for the first time, the first five words that come out of your mouth are more important than the next 25,000 that follow. And the first impression is everything. I like to call them moments of truth. When someone calls on the phone, it's a moment of truth. How are you going to uh, access the phone call and make sure all their questions are answered? It's a moment of truth. As soon as the sliding door opens up automatically, people pull in for service. How are they greeted? How are they addressed? Are all their questions answered? It's a moment of truth when someone says that they're interested in X, Y, Z, and we sit down and ask them, well, how would you like to buy the car? What would you like to do? How would you like to proceed? So we, we believe that we have built a better process where when people come into our stores, they really are comfortable. And I've said before that when you're in a retail establishment, and it doesn't have to be the car business, when you go into a retail store and you're not comfortable, and if you feel any degree of pressure, what should you do? You should leave. Absolutely. No questions asked. Now, maybe you could come back later. Well, what I But find at that moment, maybe you, sh you should leave. I will say this. When people feel that way and they get up and leave, chances are you're never going to see them mm -hmm. again. Because there are really two types. Let's take the restaurant business, for example. You go in, you order a meal, and it's not what you expected. Now, there's the people who complain, okay, and maybe they get a complimentary dessert mm -hmm. or they get the meal made over, mm -hmm. or they're the people that will eat what they want, they will pay, and, and they will leave. And never come back. Not only will they mm -hmm. never come back, but they won't tell one person, they'll tell 100 people. Mm -hmm. That's me. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you complain, they don't want to hear it. Because people in business don't necessarily understand that it's not what the proprietor thinks ab about the business or the food or the experience. It's, it's what the customer thinks. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you do not adapt your business model to the client's thoughts, desires, and the way that they wish to do business with you, not only will you fail, but you will become obsolete. And you'll be one of those companies that used to be on the Fortune 500 list that's no longer on the Fortune list at all. Mm -hmm. So, as they say, sometimes fortune favors the foolish. And in today's market, you have to do a complete reversal, and you really have to listen to the client and listen to your employees because they are the best testament for everything that you're going to accomplish. So, with that said, okay, we are going to talk about... Uh, the increase in leasing, but in a little different way. Okay, We're not going to talk about how to lease or why to lease right now. We're going to talk about the implications and ramifications that this tremendous increase in leasing, what it's doing to the car business in general, and really how there's tremendous opportunity for our clients out there. 
most people don't realize, but the end game to this tremendous increase in leasing, besides increased affordability and more expensive cars that are being put out there, is that we have a tremendous influx of one owner previously leased vehicles coming back to all the dealerships. And what that's doing is allowing us to build our inventory of pre-owned cars. And with that, Gary and I were talking earlier today of what it truly means to service a car, a pre-owned car, to get it ready for our lot and to get it ready for our clients with the most rig rigid standards uh, in the automobile business. So Gary thought it would be a good idea to talk about uh, we talk about a 163-point inspection to make a car almost new. And of course, we're not going to talk about all 163, but we are going to talk about the essentials, why it's a good idea to explore a CPO car in one of our dealerships. So with that, Gary, tell us about the, the requirements and why they're so strict and why it really is a difference when you buy an L-certified Lexus as opposed to another Lexus product off the street. Well, the L-certified program, I mean, as you know, we've talked about it on numerous occasions, um, it, it is a rigorous um, inspection process that these automobiles have to go through in order for them to be deemed L-certified car. There is a, and I have it in front of me, it's a six-page sheet of items that the technicians have to go over. And it's actually a 161-point uh, inspection, but, you know, we throw in a Two couple. Two for good luck? We, we throw in three <laughs> or four or five, you know, just, just for giggles. Um, um, just give you a general overview as to what goes on with these cars and how intense this inspection process is. Um, I'll review some of this. And this is a pass or fail um, process as well. There's so no, there's no wiggle room. There's no wiggle room. Um, as you can see right here, Veronica can attest to that. It says on the right-hand side, it says pass or fail. If it yep. doesn't okay. pass. You did see that. I did. Uh, okay. She <laughs> saw it. So anyway, um, the first thing that we do when we get one of these cars in the, in the shop in the back is we check the vehicle history, um, and we look at the national service history to make sure that the car has been maintained according to Lexus standards, um, up to and including the last service that was performed on the automobile. Um, we run a health check on the car with our tech stream data that uh, generates diagnostic reports. Um, we check for open recalls, um, special service campaigns that are available or open on the automobile that have not been done. So Gary, so I have a question about that. So let's say that we have previous clients who purchased these Lexuses from us, and of course they come back and 100% of the service is done back at our dealership. Now obviously the service history is uploaded uh, into the Lexus National History Service Bank. Correct. So this way we have a complete uh, history. Correct. But what if somebody deviates? And let's say they go to uh, a local place, and let's say instead of doing a 20,000-mile service, they just opt to go get an oil change somewhere. Will that be reflected? Good question. Um, it's reflected in the Carfax, um, whether or not the car has been maintained. And you can't really see exactly what they've done to the automobile, but our technicians can go in there and look like uh, a 20,000-mile service or something where you have to have your key fob batteries replaced or you have to have a cabin filter replaced. They can go in and check the cabin filter to see if it has been replaced. If it hasn't, nine times out of ten, it's going to be pretty dirty. However, so this is a very, very important point and another reason why uh, you want to buy from a dealer that has this type of uh, national service history that you can see. Because we believe that when we purchase the off-lease cars, we are specifically looking at the Lexus national history for the service because we don't really want to buy a car that might have 30,000 miles on it that doesn't have any national history mm -hmm. because we don't know uh, the level of service that it had. And just because it even reports that an oil change might have been done on a Carfax, we would prefer to buy a car that has all the Lexus national history that was done at a Lexus store, and we're willing to pay more for that car because we believe that it is a superior product to in turn resell to new clients. Now I have a question for you. How sure. is that oil change getting on the Carfax? Is it from the car? Is it read the computer? Great no, mo the most car. of the companies um, that are out there, like all of your, <coughs> excuse me, your aftermarket companies, and even our dealership, um, report to Carfax. So okay. it, it's there. And but what if I do it in my driveway? Then it's not going to be there uh -oh. unless you want to call Carfax and say, "Yeah, hey, just change the <laughs> oil, just put it on there." So. Okay. But um, this inspection, I'll tell you how deep this inspection goes. Um, we, do, we actually do a VIN inspection on the automobile. 
um, where the, their VIN status is verified um, in place and all the plates match on a Lexus automobile. The, the door panels, the trunk, um, all of the, um, even the front fenders and stuff have VIN plates on them and they all match where they're supposed to match. That way okay. you can tell if a panel's been replaced or anything along okay, those lines. Okay, so it was in an accident so, Gary, we put so a fender So along on. those lines, let's say that you do a VIN match and the two front fenders, the VIN plates don't match. What are we going to do? We're not certifying the car. You can't. We're, we're not going to certify the mm -hmm. automobile because right. that means that the car's been in a major collision. Mm -hmm. um, where they had to replace the fender, they probably got the fender from a junkyard. Um, because you can't replace these VIN plates, you can't buy them or anything. They they come with the car, and once they're on there, they're on there. If we find that they're missing, um, or th there's one that's doesn't, the VINs are two different VINs, then th that's going to throw mm -hmm. up a red flag. Mm -hmm. um, the Carfax might say something in there as well, um, as as far as the car has been damaged. But it depends on the insurance company and the, the facility that repairs the automobile whether or not they report to Carfax or mm -hmm. not, um, which most do. But keep in do. mind, it's not even so much of the... Uh, well, if insurance is going to pay for that repair, it'll definitely be on the, on the car yes, facts. Yes, but, but more if important, it's, it's, it it's, it's, it's before that. Because what happens now is the police departments are connected that way. So whenever there is a reported accident, okay, it's automatically reported to Carfax. Okay. Now, it's, it's interesting, and I could verify that because I was recently in a pretty bad collision. Uh, and uh, it showed... Uh, Prior to the, to the uh, car being completely repaired, it did show that there was a collision. It showed the date. And it's interesting because it will tell you whether or not the airbags deployed. Okay. It will also tell you whether or not the car was disabled. Correct. And it will also say that the car was being able to driven away. Now, Carfax is uh, a little bit more complete <coughs> where they actually will tell you that uh, reported accident, no damage. So let's say, for example, that you're standing in traffic and there are two cars behind you that, that tap each other mm -hmm. and one taps, but someone wanted to make a police report on it. So your car might be included in that police report and it will say uh, accident but no damage. So, you know, when people come in and we uh, look at those cars, whether we make a decision to keep that car mm -hmm. or not, we want to make sure that there really is no damage. No damage. Because mm -hmm. sometimes even if there's a small ding or a chip or let's say uh, there's a scuff or something on the bumper and you get it repainted, that sometimes can be reported to Carfax. So we have to assure the client that, well, you have to understand, it was a parking lot ding. Right. It's different if a shopping cart made a little dent Correct. versus another vehicle. As opposed vehicle. to a semi-truck, right. you know, slamming into the back of exactly. your car. Exactly. A little Th different. There's a huge difference. Well, mm -hmm. the point that Steve mm -hmm. just made, my, my girlfriend Sharon just same identical thing happened to her. Um, she was parked at a stoplight. Somebody hit the person that was in back of her and pushed that car into mm -hmm. the car that she was driving and, you know, did a little bit of damage to it. I'm curious to see if that's going to show up on the Carfax once we get, you know, everything taken care of. So you have independent uh, repair shops that report. You have, uh, I, I, I believe, all new car dealerships, all brands, they report, okay, because they want the service history mm -hmm. because it makes the cars more valuable. Uh, and I understand to, to order those replacement parts, you have to supply the VIN. And right. yes. there's the connection right there. Yes. Because yeah, everything right. is computerized mm -hmm. now. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing with the uh, with with uh, the tire stuff. When you go online, you know, it asks you for the make and model. It doesn't ask for VIN specific, though. Mm -hmm. But uh, it will ask you for the trim level. So, you know, the trim level would denote whether it's an essential build or it was a mid-level or uh, it's a hybrid or a hybrid because that would be a different it could be a different rim size could be a different tire size mm -hmm. capacity rating yeah. on the tires a little bit more although some of the online sites that you would buy tires on online they would ask for a specific VIN number which I've seen because we like to do those comparisons yeah but ours mm -hmm. is very very simple it's just model specific that's why it's essential that you have to buy your uh, Lexus L certified car from a Lexus dealership because we rigorous standards to get these cars and you know, you're putting your family in these cars and you're taking them on trips and stuff, and you just want to make sure that that car is safe and it's been maintained and everything is mm -hmm. good. And you don't have, and, and it, it's a hassle worrying about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. Well, the thing about buying a uh, L certified Lexus model, it takes all the fear out of the purchase. It used to be, well, I don't want to buy someone else's lemon. And especially when you used to see people that were to trade a car in that's only two or three months old with 1,500 miles. People would scratch their head. And Why say, didn't they want to keep okay, it? Okay, what happened? See, I automatically Why? go up. Oh, they could. They they couldn't make the payment anymore. Oh, they got over their head. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Or the car was uncomfortable for them. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it, it happens. Yeah. Or, you know, sometimes, you know, unfortunately, there, there's a change of circumstance. Sometimes there's a death in the family. I mean, we see a- almost every type of thing happen. But when you're able to find those cars with 1,500 or 2,000 mm-hmm. miles that are absolutely perfect, and then certify them and get the better warranty, like we spoke about last week, uh, it's, it's a tremendous, tremendous advantage. But, Gary, getting back to... Uh, some of the things that we check okay um we we did the vehicle history check so we talked about that for a while um next thing we do is a vehicle exterior check we check for body damage dents dings paint chips and scratches and things of that nature panel alignments which is very critical to these cars because if the panels aren't aligned or they're not fitting properly then you want to scratch your head and start looking a little bit when i think about panel alignment i remember when lexus first came out in 1989 the marble marble commercial Mm -hmm. And how perfect the marble rolls. Well, so you guys don't carry marbles in the service. Well, you know, we we have uh, we have levels and we have all kinds of uh, measuring devices that we measure these cars with. I noticed that with my very first Toyota, that everything was perfect. The, all the all the yeah. all the, the gaps finishes, were perfect, and yeah. you you wondered why the other guys couldn't get it right. It's it's the precision. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's yeah. perfect. It's yeah. perfect. Paying attention to pursuit the of excellence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we check the trim and the moldings on the car, windshield, glass condition. doesn't have to be, like, if you get a rock chip in your car and you get your, your glass replaced, it doesn't have to be a Lexus windshield, but it has to meet OEM standards um, in order for it to pass. Speaking of uh, windshield replacement, this is a general uh, statement that I'm going to make, and a lot of people don't know this, but in the state of Florida, if there is damage to your front windshield, your insurance company will replace that windshield, no charge, no deductible. Correct. And that is a state law. So if you're driving down the highway and you pick up a pebble and there is a crack, chip, or some something that goes wrong with the windshield, you are able to get that replaced with no deductible, straight through your comprehensive insurance, does not impact your insurance whatsoever. And, you know, we see a lot of that with people driving up You've and down the highway. You've tried 95, yeah. 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 We see case, a lot. In, case in point, Sharon's daughter, yeah. uh, who leased a IS from us, um, called me last week, and she said, oh, my gosh, so I got a big old crack in my windshield. And I just simply told her, I said, call your insurance company. There's no deductible. And sure enough, they came out easy, replaced it, and she was yep. happy. Mm-hmm. No, no worries. So anyway, that, that's the vehicle exterior stuff. We, you know, we check the headlamps, the tail lamps, the lens conditions, and all other kind of stuff um, as well. Um, then you go into the vehicle um, interiors. Well, l- let's talk a little bit more about the exterior. Um, you know, the smart key operation, the door functions, the open and closing, the, the warning chimes, um, the wireless remote operations on the car, we check all that. The um, light indicators, all the lights, the puddle lamps, the headlights, the low beams, the high beams, they have to work properly, the adaptive headlight operation. Gary, when, you take, when we take the car and trade or purchase uh, a new certified pre-owned car, do we also change the key fob remote batteries? We, we do. That is, mm-hmm. it actually, is that it's, it's, it's mandatory. It's mm-hmm. mandatory. And, and that's and that's part of our 163-point inspection, uh, throwing a little bit of inspection processes mm-hmm. here. We do that automatically for, with, with every pre-owned car that we um, run through the shop, whether it's certified or not, we change the key fob batteries. It's right. not that expensive, and it saves the client a hassle if the key mm-hmm. fob battery quits working on the car. Um, I mean, we, we go as far as to check the license plates, <coughs> excuse me, the mounting brackets, the side markers. Um, then you go into the vehicle interior, um, you know, the seat belts, the gear shifts, the radio settings, the headliner, the dome lights. We even check the floor mats to make sure that they've got the clips on them so the floor mats. And that's a big thing with Lexus and Toyota and most manufacturers these days. Mm-hmm. That floor mats have to be stationary in the car. Um, you know, one of the things that we do when you bring your car into our service drive is we make sure that you don't have stacked floor mats. And the reason that you want to take those stacked floor mats out of there, it can trap the accelerator pedal. Mm-hmm. And that's where most of the unintended acceleration issues occurred with um, mm-hmm. cars a few years back was the accelerator pedals were being trapped by something that was laid on top of the floor mats. So listening to these volumes of tests that our service department conducts on these cars, I guess the bottom line and purpose is that when people drive out in one of our L-certified cars, the only thing that that you should ever worry about is when the next recommended service maintenance is done. And putting gas in it. And, you know, it's really interesting because early on in the car business, I remember seeing people buying pre-owned cars. They would come back the next day. This is not operating properly. The radio doesn't sound right. There's a blown speaker. Or uh, it just, they weren't perfect pre-owned cars. And what Lexus has done uh, with the L certified brand and with their 161 plus point inspection is truly take <coughs> a car and make it 
an almost new car and it completely takes the fear out of buying a new car that's why when when uh, we talk about people who purchase Lexuses pre-owned whether from private parties or from non Lexus dealerships that's why we offer a free inspection process if they'd like us to look the car over because when a car is not in warranty it's rather expensive to repair all cars are mm-hmm. okay but uh, we just feel it's very important that when people do purchase they need to know exactly what they're getting and we're happy to run a car fax for them to see uh, nothing is worse than thinking you're getting a great deal and then when you come in for service and you pull the car fax or when you get home after you bought the car and you see that the car was in a previous collision and it was disabled and the airbags did go off mm-hmm. uh, because there's no right of rescission in Florida. You can't return a car. So it's really important and it's incumbent not only on the dealership to make sure that they're selling the best product out there, but it's incumbent on the buyer uh, to really know what they're getting and to be educated about this process. Right. The bottom line is everything, everything on the car works. Um, back to tires and brakes and stuff, Steve. Um, tires, the tires on a certified car, they have to be a minimum of 530 seconds. All four of the tires on the ground have to have the same uh, speed rating brand. They have to match 100% brakes. Um, they have to be at least 630 seconds in order for them to pass. If they're below that, then we replace them. So the car's you know, like you said, it's almost brand new, almost brand new. And another advantage of buying it through us is that uh, we're happy to pull the repair orders and show you what was done. Yes. Because uh, we, we, do it all want, time. we want that validation. We want people to see, well, you don't have to worry about replacing the brakes again. You don't have to worry about replacing the tires. But We've see, these are, these are wear and tear things. These are things that are going to wear out just because Correct. you're driving a car. Sure. What if the car has had like service through Lexus because it's <coughs> something went wrong mm-hmm. what, what do you is mean bad service with no I'm saying that something, something so you're right something broke on the car right like something well, we know we repair cars under warranty mm-hmm. all day long okay um, so if, if something on a Lexus which is rare and I'm not saying that it doesn't happen but these cars they don't break you maintain these automobiles and you can drive them forever mm-hmm. occasionally we'll get something that breaks on the car and we'll replace it with a brand new part we don't okay. use we don't use um, so that wouldn't affect this no, inspection because you know it was it's repaired correctly part. okay right, with an authentic Lexus part mm-hmm. right, right. and also it's documented in uh, the national service history right we go as far mm-hmm. as to check the VIN number on the automobile against the VIN number on the engine and the transmission and the drivetrains and stuff like that they're marked everything matters so if a car had an engine problem or something along, you know, God forbid something happened to it, um, or had flood damage or something along those lines, we would know it through the Carfax. And if we didn't pick it up through the Carfax, we would check the VIN plate against the VIN plate that was on the engine. And they have to match. If they don't match, then we're not certifying the car. Very mm-hmm. interesting uh, point that you just said, flood damage. Okay, we got to talk about that. We have a few of those around here. When there is inclement weather, and uh, actually, we could talk about, like, Louisiana. We could talk about what happened with Sandy up in New York or the hurricanes down here, and cars are flooded. Or torrential downpours. That we For had. the most part, the cars would be totaled. However, sometimes when cars are totaled, somehow they still end up at automobile auctions, and sometimes it's not marked on car facts or auto checklists to determine that there was flood damage. And one of the things that we do, which is really, really important, uh, because there are telltale signs if a car was underwater. You can see it. So by putting the cars on the list, we have to make an educated decision if it's not reported in a Carfax. And if we have any reason to believe that that car has been underwater, uh, that's not something that we're going to be ever selling. Mm it, it's just it's just the wrong thing to do. Number one, and also when a car's on the water, you can really expect all different types of problems. Whether right. it be electrical, it, the car's never going to be the same. And unfortunately, th- those cars do make their way out on the marketplace. They do. Mm-hmm. We see them all the time. Yeah. Our our cars have computers on the in the floorboards and stuff. And if water gets up into the door and into the floorboard area. Um, it damages computers, amplifiers, stereo amplifiers, and things of that nature. We check the connections and stuff, and we see that they're corroded and rust, and, and then there's a wicking problem where the stuff gets down inside the wires, and you can't see it, and it starts, you know, it, it, it's just a mess. But 
That's why we go through this rigorous inspection process. And we even do that when the car comes in to just have regular maintenance done on it. We do not as extensive as a 161-point inspection checklist, but we do a th pretty thorough inspection of the automobile to, you know, give you a heads up as to say, hey, you know, your brakes are at 4, 5, 30 seconds right now. You're good until next visit, but just be prepared for it. Our brakes are always on special like our tires, so um, we're probably going to have to replace your brakes during your next visit. What's a very interesting process that we have in both our dealerships is that whatever the car comes in for, we do a full diagnostic, and it's called a multi-point inspection. And it is a computerized sheet where it has green lights, yellow lights, and red lights near each application and inspection point. The reason why we do that is that uh, we develop long-term relationships with our clients. And when a car is brand new and we do the initial 5,000-mile service, obviously everything is going to be green lights. 10,000-mile service, mostly everything is going to be green lights. Make it a yellow cabin filter or air filter or something. So when we get into, let's say, a 15,000-mile service, if there's a yellow light, okay, it doesn't mean that they have to spend money to replace anything or to change anything. But what we do is we alert people ahead of time that it's most probable that the next service, you might want to consider changing this mm -hmm. because of X, Y, Z. So just like consumers don't like surprises, we don't like surprises. So by keeping a electronic dossier, and we like to email this to people as well, okay, which is really a great practice, so this way they will have it as a record, they can see the status of their car, and they can see a natural progression, because as the cars grow older, and as there are more miles put on, and we continue to do these multi-point inspections, uh, it's a gradual spend, as opposed to all of a sudden coming in, and it's $3,000. So when we recommend something, it's not that it's spur of the moment. It's things that develop over time. It's just like our bodies. When we get older, there's certain different tests mm -hmm. that we need to be doing. We don't want to do them. But it also, it looks as though you're protecting my investment. And investments in a vehicle, is it's not cheap these days. It's not. But you're helping me to protect <sighs> and prepare the money that I have invested protect in this car. Yep. Most people have a hard time believing, but we really are in their corner to preserve the car as long as possible and for the least amount of cost out. Nobody sure, because you might be getting that car back as a trade. Exactly. Well, exactly. That's a good point. Yeah. And we call that the full circle approach. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, when we take that 2,000 mile car and trade and we sell it and let's say we release it for three years, well, that three year old car is going to come back again. We might be able to recertify the car and sell it again, and it might be out there for another couple mm -hmm. hundred thousand miles. And it's still a safe vehicle for the next person. Exactly. So by doing these multi-point inspections on everybody who comes through the door, not only do we give the clients a heads up as to the performance and uh, everything that is going on in the vehicle, but there are no sudden surprises. And uh, people do not like surprises. Uh, in business, we don't like surprises. So we like to have a very smooth curve of the way things are. I, w I read a very, very interesting article uh, this weekend up in New York about a company called Lyft. Now, Lyft is a uh, competitor, a uh, new company that is really designed to compete with Uber. Okay. And the premise about Lyft is, is that they're predicting that by the year 2020, which is really not very far off, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of electric automobiles that will be driverless that uh, will take you to point A to B to C just by accessing your smartphone. The car will pull right up, and they're talking about how it's going to do away with a lot of cars in the cities, uh, that millennials are going to rethink the way they do car ownership in different parts of the country. The well, we've already have them looking at tiny homes. Yes, I've seen <laughs> that on, on uh, that network, and yeah. I don't know how anybody okay. can do it. I need that much space just for my Christmas decoration. Yeah. Or closet, right? <laughs> yeah, so, shoes. So what was interesting, they said that the average cost of ownership per year is between eight and $9,000. So I'm thinking about... Well, that, that's probably true because the average car payment is about $500, so that's $6,000 a year. 
figure you're going to spend. Well, maybe by then we'll not be going to jobs either. Well, we're going to be going to work. <laughs> we'll <laughs> be another, working from home. One way or another, we're still going to have to pay for everything. <laughs> but uh, so you figure the average car payment is five hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. So that's six thousand. Figure a couple thousand dollars a year for gasoline. Mm-hmm. All right. And then another thousand for insurance. So I think they're spot on with the average ownership cost, okay, of about nine, eight to nine thousand dollars a year. So imagine not buying that car and having a car at your beck and call and they say it will be pennies. I think this is a sad world because I love my car. Yeah. (laughs) Well, we also believe that that is probably going to be an extremely limited application Mm -hmm. because more so than anywhere else in the world, Americans have a love affair with their cars. Exactly. All you need to do is go to the auto show down in Miami that attracts more than 500,000 people for the week. And people, there are more oohs and Mm ahs. And when you see the new model, all it does is fill the showrooms and people are ready. And as a testimony to that, every year right around this time, we're getting the phone calls. Are the new ones in yet? Are the new ones in yet? So Mm -hmm. we do have a magnificent love affair with cars. And we always, I remember as a kid, I used to go to the auto shows with my dad. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't wait to go to look at the car. It was my favorite thing to do. We used to go into the city and, and spend the whole day, and we couldn't wait to see the new cars. And it hasn't changed all these yeah. years later. So all these companies are talking about this driverless technology and everything. Uh, the biggest problem, what, though— Where's the fun in that? <laughs> well, there's probably not any fun in it, but yeah. here's, here's the problem that they're debating that they don't understand, is that who's going to own those cars? Can a company go out and buy a million cars for driverless cars and afford that burden? Or are people going to own the cars that are driverless and they just yeah. drive by themselves? Or do a so, timeshare. So it's a, it is a real You know how dilemma. they do the bicycles that you can borrow? Maybe they'll be like that. Yeah. They'll just be parked well, and you, you know, just access them. A lot of people have ride share. Them, There's ride share programs out there as well now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I want to get in my own car. Yeah, I do I, wanna, I want my controls to be <laughs> set too. the same way when I get in. Uh-huh. And it's a thing called pride of ownership yeah. or pride of lease ownership, if you will, because most people lease now. Uh, but our world is changing dramatically. And uh, I, there's so much chatter about that. And then the next thing on, on the horizon are the flying cars. Now well, we're all, that. you know, we were promised that a way, way back. Well, Remember, like meet th- George Jetson? The year Jetson? 2000, we're supposed <laughs> to have hover yeah. cars and stuff. They yes. are out there, and there are companies that do build them, all right? Uh, whether it will catch on or not, uh, that's a whole different story. Well, look, if you go back to the 60s, do you remember the Amphi car? Yes. Okay, do you remember that car? It was no. the coolest thing. Okay. Amphi car, yeah. So not real, not real stylish. Well, uh... It was a small little compact car that was a convertible, Gary. It's a car. That uh, no amphicar. It was called an amphicar. Oh, and you, know you what were I do able that. I to do drive the car yep. into the water. I remember. You it. flipped the switch on the dash, and the two propellers, propellers. in the back. Yeah. I mean, it went very I slow. I remember. I remember. They leaked like sieves, mm-hmm. yeah. and they're worth about a hundred thousand dollars today if you could find them. Amazing. And we're uh, at the bottom of the lake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta find them. There may be some yeah. there. <laughs> it's a great. It's Did a. Gr- it, they tried to like cross like the English Channel or something with someone, t- and I don't think they they made it. I don't know about that but uh they I, tried to cross some big body of they water they didn't hold the water that well <laughs> <laughs> they really weren't designed for it but for short excursions on the yeah. water and uh you do see them and they're very very expensive it's really a coveted collectible now okay uh, but it was called the amphi car and i remember it because uh, growing up in westchester county new york uh, there was a small uh hometown chevrolet dealership and he had them in the showroom and i always used to go with my dad and we used to look at them, and I remember as a kid sitting in that car wondering. I always wanted one. Mm-hmm. Did I rode in one. one. Did I, you really? Yes, I yeah. did. They had one. It, I grew up in suburban Chicago, mm-hmm. and we went to Santa's Village as little kids, which was okay. sort of like a local amusement yep, park kind I'm of place. And it. they had one. And we rode in the Amphicar. They would take it out of the water and bring it right back, and next so load of kids. So you actually went in, yes. and you went into the water and everything? Yes. Was that amazing? Yeah, it was. Wow. Yeah. Now looking back at the way that they go in the water, I get like, what was my mother thinking? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Put her kids in the car. They don't look real stable. Well, that's probably why they only lasted for a couple, three years. (laughs) Yes. But uh, (laughs) it's funny how you look at things like that now, and they're collectibles. Mm -hmm. Like the DeLorean. 
Well, uh, the DeLorean will live on forever, thanks to uh, Michael J. Fox. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Back to the But they future. are incredible cars, and who would have ever thought yeah. that you could make a car? Oh, I wanted one steel. when they came out. Well, they're pretty interesting collector cars mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, I wish I had one, too. I actually have a friend of mine who has three of them. And uh, you mm-hmm. need Brillo pads, really, to clean yeah, them up. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah. And they, I believe yeah. you can still buy new parts. Someone bought all the extras, and you can still... I would imagine technically you can. P- yeah. part by yeah. part you can build a I brand new it. one, well, but it would John be John DeLorean, very expensive. Um, who was a GM guy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that there's parts out there for him. Mm-hmm. So probably stockpile them. So what is yeah. it now, Gary? I think that uh, when you discontinue a car, or used used to be with the major domestics, you had to keep the parts uh, well, Saturn, available for 20 years. I think Saturn is a prime example of that. When Saturn shut down their operations, you were able to take your Saturn to any GM dealership and get it fixed. And Pontiac is the same way now because they're out. Uh, and, yes, you have to keep the parts. I think you have to keep a stockpile of the parts. The thing about General Motors cars, though, is most of the parts are interchangeable. Um, but uh, they have to keep the parts. Because all like their cars used to look the same. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Buick, mm-hmm. it was an Oldsmobile. It mm-hmm. did. You know? well, when I was, it was, it was a was sad day when they did away yeah. with Pontiac. Well, when I was working yeah. for Chevrolet, um, I had dealers call me up and said, hey, I got this uh, Cavalier in here, and it's got a Cimarron badge on it. You know, it was a Chevrolet, but it had Cadillac parts on it. So they were built at the same plant, and somebody mm-hmm. just wasn't paying attention and put a Cadillac steering wheel on a Chevrolet product. It was well, funny. that's what Cadillac <laughs> is trying to forget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they've come a long way, too. They, they have. Build a nice, nice car now. cars now. They, do, they build a nice car. Yes, they did. But anyway, so I found it very interesting, and we had a uh, roundtable discussion about whether or not people felt, and this was with a group of our friends and family, we were talking about this over the weekend, about these companies, because so many people use Uber. Mm -hmm. But Uber, the premise is that people own their own cars, and they just use it to make extra money. So how would it be... Are are people going to go out and buy electric cars so they can work for Uber? Or is Uber going to go out and buy millions of cars? Now, Uber, so isn't Uber the one trying with the, the, the driver list already? Yeah. They haven't, yeah. yeah. yeah they're trying. Google, Is Google. it because they had a little trouble with some drivers? Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> Google's going to get into that business really big here pretty soon as well. So I think that we, we're we really going to have some uh, explosive technology coming. Actually, it's interesting. You look at our uh, 2017, the majority of our models for Lexus and Toyota have all the new safety features now with uh, the stop by themselves and the lane departures and peripheral visions and what have you. And a lot of the cars have that now. So uh, as we get more advanced, the cars are step by step coming so much closer to driving themselves. But, you know, if you really take a minute and think about all the movies that allegedly happened in the future. For example, the one that comes to mind right now is with Arnold Schwarzenegger in Total Recall. And if you remember when they were in the cars, they had a uh, mannequin or a dummy with the appearance of driving the car. Mm-hmm. So it looked like he was as a chauffeur, but he really wasn't. The car was completely computerized. Mm-hmm. Is that something we're going to see? I like knows? to drive my car. I mean, I'm just, uh, but you know what? My day has come and gone. <laughs> you know, I think millions of young people, of people are looking forward. No, I, you know, something I think that so many people do get pleasure out of driving their own car. And, uh, you know, there's certainly pride of ownership when people come into the, to the new car dealerships uh, and whether they buy a brand new car or, you know, they buy a pre-owned car. I mean, we treat people if they come in and they buy a five thousand dollar car. It's the biggest occasion for them, and uh, it, it's so celebratory, and there's such wonderful pride of ownership, whether someone spends $5,000 or they spend $100,000 on a mm-hmm. car. It really doesn't matter because the reactions and the emotional responses are really the same with sure. everybody. So I can't imagine that that's going to be going away. I think the way that we buy cars and the way that we finance cars is going to go away. It's going to change dramatically, and it is already. The dealerships that are progressing – and doing things differently by listening to the voice of the client are the ones that are uh, innovating and leaving 90% of the other dealerships behind. Because like anything else, it's the technology and people want to do business the way they want to do business. And if you buck that trend and you try to keep it the old way of doing business with a system of how to sell, uh, I think you're going to find that you're going to be losing more and more and more of your clients, and they're going to be gravitating over to stores and retail establishments that uh, that really cater to them. You know, the biggest complaint today, and this is just not in the car business, but it's in the retail business and service business, is service. Customer service is just not really good anymore. 
I mean, when you think about it, how many industries you get put on hold, you can't talk to a live person, you have to hit three for this, four for that, and by the time you get, you're getting ready. You might get disconnected. You're right, you're getting ready <laughs> to get that question answered, and all of a sudden you get disconnected, yeah. and you have to start all over again. Yeah, it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether it's the cable companies, whether it's uh, any kind of big company, corporation, uh, some of the companies out there now are changing the way they do things. For example, American Express had this whole push where they're not going to have any recorded uh, messages. So when you call in, the idea is that you're always going to speak to a live operator. Mm -hmm. And I remember... Somewhere in the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully here. <laughs> yeah. So I remember starting at the Lexus store, and uh, the first week, all I did was sit by our coffee bar and by the reception and concierge area, and I wanted to meet our clientele. And I would ask them if they had a few minutes, if I can buy them a cup of coffee and sit down, if I could ask them a few questions. And the recurring things that I asked about, you know, what is it that you like the most about coming here or any retail establishment? And what are the things that you really dislike about the business? So what they told me was is that wait time on the phone and going into voicemail and waiting for a phone call back. They said that that is the most infuriating thing that there is. Mm -hmm. And what we find with studies is that if you're on hold for more than a minute, which is totally unacceptable, you kind of lose faith in that company. And sometimes people who are impatient, they're just going to hang up. And, you know, it's very, very easy to scroll on your phone today and click the call, the next company. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go and find a phone book. You don't have to call, what was it, 411 for information. Right, right. I don't even know that they have 411 <laughs> information anymore. Yeah, and but we haven't used it in a long yeah, time. I, I, yeah. I can't imagine that they right. do because there's no need for it anymore. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is is that one of the things that we instituted was that we have what's called live handoffs. So when someone calls into the dealership, we have a live receptionist, mm -hmm. and before we transfer the call to someone's extension, we make sure that they're accessible and on the line. And they okay. know, what, and we know what they're calling about, so they don't have to repeat. Yeah, because exactly. that does happen. Fixed, you make you make a phone call. You it. speak to the receptionist. Yep. She transfers you, and that's and as you far as it goes. Over. Right, and you have to start over. Yeah. So on occasion, though, that particular person might be busy. So mm -hmm. we have a runner system. We have uh, electronic portable phones that work with our receptionists. So they actually can get out. They're not stationary. They can get out. They can walk right down to the particular service writer or manager and hand them that message. So within minutes, we're able to contact that person and get back to them. And every time we do that, you always hear from the client, thank you so much mm -hmm. for returning the call. Yeah, I hear that, it a lot. I hear it all the time. Yeah. And that leads me to believe that the customer service level people don't return mm -hmm. the calls. So uh, very quickly, let me just share where our dealerships are located. Exactly. Our Lexus dealership is located in Fort City of Fort Pierce. We're just south, one block south of Midway Road on the west side of the street on US-1. And our Toyota dealership is in the heart of Stewart on US-1 on the east side of the street, and that's Treasure Coast Toyota of Stewart. So when you have an opportunity, please come by, visit us. Say uh, hello. Say hello to Gary and service. Uh, come by, see me. We're always in the dealership six days a week, and uh, we'd love to meet you, see you, and answer any of your questions. Great. And, of course, the Treasure Coast Car Guys every Tuesday beginning at 11. Join us here next week for the Treasure Coast Car Guys. Thanks again. Our Thank pleasure. you. Thank you. You're listening to WPSL Port St. Lucie, WSTU Stewart.